I'm, I'm thrilled to be here um, this morning. I've been, as uh, my little bio says, very, um, very engaged with the project of bringing um, relational psychoanalysis and self-psychology and um, philosophy of the implicit and focusing together. Um, both of these are concerned with the process of emergence uh, in therapy and how that integrally involved with the, uh, the therapeutic interaction um, and the relationship that the, that the patient has with um, the therapist and with themselves are our one kind of unity. Um, it seems like there are many assumptions and concerns that these two traditions hold together, but um, they have come from different intellectual heritages and uh, sometimes not quite on speaking terms, these two, um, the humanistic and the, the psychoanalytic. Um, and, and so the cultures are really different. And we're hoping that um, the experience this morning will be uh, an intercultural venture and dialogue. Um, sometimes in the program that I do, my psychoanalytic students are sometimes put off by the uh, focusing language. And the focusing students are sometimes um, unhappy with the psychoanalytic lexicon and culture. And so today I'm going to try to make these experience near and experience friendly and, uh, and want you to get involved with, with the dialogue. <coughs> All of the things that we're doing today are about, uh, about uh, you and about helping you to think and helping you to um, have, helping you to, to get involved with uh, this conversation that I think is a very, very important conversation. Um, <clears throat> these traditions have lived in me very much intertwined since my beginnings as a psychotherapist. Uh, I had studied um, many forms of therapy in my early years and still felt sort of ungrounded, like I didn't know how to put them together. And in the midst of a big move in my apartment filled with boxes, I came across this flyer about Eugene Gemlin, who I didn't know of, doing a workshop on experiential listening. And uh, somehow I just had this feeling, this felt sense, that I should go to this, left my whole living room filled with boxes, and uh, went to this this workshop, and it was a feeling of coming home. It was a feeling of um, love at first sight. Something about the breadth of this approach coming from a philosophy and, and a new way of thinking, and also being involved with a very, very small detail of movement. In this workshop, uh, which was over 30 years ago, I still remember, we were learning how to listen not to the content, but to, um, to what wanted to be said, what the, the person was holding inside that hadn't quite uh, come into words and thoughts yet. And so, of course, that's the essence of what uh, focusing-oriented uh, therapy is concerned with. Um, so I, I studied with, with Jenlin and, and um, started a, a training program with him and did some therapy with him. And then he left New York and I was still hungry for something. I felt like this was, was a wonderful grounding, but I didn't know something that I really wanted to know about working in the relationship in therapy. What is this therapy relationship that is so sort of magical in a way that, that in an hour sometimes, 45 minutes, once or twice a week, that this relationship can become so intimate and deep and life-changing. And um, I had trouble studying psychoanalysis because of the way it was taught at that time until 
poet came along and self psychology and uh, that gave me an entree into a whole world of um, psychoanalytic thinking. Um, I loved Kohut's way of um, of talking about the, the relational needs that we all have and how therapy is a way of addressing those those deep needs and uh, that these are needs not that you have in childhood and then you and you grow out of and then you become an independent mature adult but these are needs that you have from from life to death and and uh, 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 Relational self-psychology gives me a way of looking at the detail of the relationship in therapy and um, navigating that relationship. So, so from, from the philosophy of the implicit and, and the, the focusing, I get something philosophic, something um, new and broad in thinking. And also the, the very small micro-movements of how to facilitate emergence in therapy. From, from psychoanalysis, I get something about the journey over time, the relationship as it unfolds. And um, in, in that, I get a rich theory. The theory is sort of in the middle, you know, this philosophy, practice, and theory in the middle and I get a lot of wonderful uh, input from all different branches of the large tent of, of um, relational um, self-psychology and, and in that of course I'm including the neighbors of it infant research, intersubjective systems, mm -hmm. how we take from complexity theory um, <coughs> trauma theory all of that um, <coughs> so um, in my uh, attempt to have a cross-cultural venture, I, I decided to lay down some ground rules. The psychoanalysts are not to interpret this morning, and the focusing people are not allowed to hug. <laughs> but, or tell anybody to go inside or anything like that. We're not allowed to go inside. <laughs> no, you can go inside, but we're not going to say that, uh, in those words at least. But if you're a, a psychoanalyst and you're a focusing person, I guess then maybe you can hug and interpret. I'm not <laughs> sure about that, because we have lots of permutations here. I'm going to share with you uh, a little... Um, clinical exchange um, as soon as you get your papers and um, let's notice the function of theory as we go through this this little narrative um, theory is a lens a map, an orientation. I've even given a talk about theory as a good mother, you know, the mother that can guide us and help us in, in our moments of our moments of crisis in um, the clinical exchange, rather than uh, rather than the um, way we we hold theory as a sort of patriarchal figure that tells us we're doing it wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, but uh, if you notice um, how you're uh, paying attention, what you're seeing, theory highlights something, some aspect of experience and brings it alive and um, your orientation will determine what you, what you notice. So I'm going to ask you afterwards what you noticed. Uh, well, you're, you're going to notice as I'm reading, right. You have to do two. It, uh, Ellen always says she can't do two things at the same time. <clears throat> my buzzer rang and I came to the door expecting my patient, Pat. Much to my surprise, a, a stranger stood at the door, handing me an envelope and said, 
I'm D. My friend Pat gave me her session. There's a note and a check in the envelope. Taken aback, I sputtered, well, she didn't mention anything to me about this. Oh, it happened quite spontaneously, Dee explained. Is it okay? I paused for a moment thinking, what does this mean? How do I understand this? We, we analysts are always asking, you know, what does it mean? How do I understand this? Um, but since I had been cultivating spontaneity and improvisation, I thought, oh, what the hell, let's see what happens. I invited the stranger in. <clears throat> she smiled appreciatively and began immediately to tell me how she had a meltdown over the weekend and was quite uncharacteristically at her wit's end. She said that she has always been very well, has done very well in her career. She's always had wonderful jobs until the recession hit and she was laid off. She's been looking vigorously, sending out hundreds of resumes but getting no response. She said that she has always been a push-through person. But now she's come to the end of the line where there's nowhere to push through. Although she has always been the person that others rely on for her resourcefulness and stability, she now feels invisible, resourceless, and helpless. She had poured out her heart to her friend Pat and said that she feels like nobody knows how much trouble she feels she's in. And Pat had given her the session. I was immediately engaged and impressed with the way she was speaking. Right from the feeling level, um, the, the, the nuances that she was articulating of the quality of her experience how is it to be a push-through person with no place to push through, I said. It's demoralizing, confusing, disorienting. It's like the world has turned upside down and everything is different. It's a different world. I've always been able to go after what I want and now I can't. Me. The world is different, not responding to you in the same way, and you feel different? D. Nobody's reaching out to me, maybe because everyone feels that I'm the one that has it all together, the one who is blessed. Oh, I said, yes, I see. Maybe they can't conceive of the one who has it all together uh, needing help from them. What am I supposed to do? I've always been the responsible one. How can I be responsible? How can I push through when there's no response? I was sort of taken by surprise here. And it felt like it needed something. So I said, what a question. Maybe we can pause here and see what might come right from that question. Let's listen and see if something shows up. She was taken by surprise, but she settled back in her chair and was quiet. There was a long pause. She looked down as if to, to read something from inside. And then in a more reflective tone, she said, I think I'm supposed to ask. I wasn't expecting this answer. Yes. Um, ask, I said, ask. Yes, she looks down again as if to find what, wants, uh, what she wants to say. I never had to ask for an anything. Even as a child, I didn't ask my parents. They saw me as the strong one in the family, and somehow I think that I need to learn how to ask. Ask for help to be a new way. It's hard for me, Dee says. What's hard about it? I feel as if it's weak to ask, ungrateful. It's not appreciating all I have, all I've been given. Me. 
Asking doesn't fit with who you feel you are in the world. It doesn't seem right for you, even though it's right for other people. D. Yes, that's right. I'm not the one who asks. And then there's a pause, and you know how it is that are kind of stuck and the, and the patient needs something and there are pauses that are pregnant pauses and we need to leave those and see the next thing that comes. But this seemed like, um, like a stuck pause. So I said, what did it feel like to turn to Pat? Was that a kind of asking? D looks up surprised. I guess I was asking then. I cried, I told her everything. I was even angry at her for not noticing how distraught I've been. How did it actually feel to ask? With a smile, it actually felt strong and direct. It felt like it took courage and that I had the courage. It felt good, it didn't feel weak. It didn't feel ungrateful. It felt straightforward. Day. Straightforward, strong, courageous. What a recognition that is. The actual experience was so different from what you thought. It really was different. And both of us just sort of took this in for a while. And I said, and is this coming to me, a stranger, a kind of asking? Are you implicitly asking me for something? D laughs, sits back. Yes, that took a lot of courage. That was really a risk. I've never done anything as difficult as that. How is it? It feels very good. You know, I am the kind of person who can say what's really going on. I am someone who can take risks. Me. You were a push-through person about asking, weren't you? She grins. Yes, I am that person, even though I've never done it before. This is truly who I am. I just love the little, uh, the little turn there at the end, that she's never done it before, but, but this is who she truly is is. Um, I chose this vignette because it, it has both elements of self-psychology and elements of focusing and I thought we could tease that out together. Um, what did you notice? We're not going to have a lot of time to talk about that, but just call out. Just anything you noticed. I noticed that you <laughs> my voice changed at one point, and that was my focusing voice. Very interesting. There is a focusing voice, yes. And is there a psychoanalytic voice? I guess so, yes. What else? Yes, yes, yes. And she kindly gave me permission to, to talk about this with you. Yes, that's something that, that uh, I, of course, noticed also, that she um, was very open and, um, and her feelings, that level of experience was, was accessible f for her from the start. You know, it, it's really cheating to use this um, vignette because what we usually are struggling with is very far from the person who comes through the door and is, is right ready to explore in this way. Um, but I'm allowed to cheat because I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you notice? Yes. It seems significant, very significant that with all the filters we could do somebody in effect stranger comes in and you could respond in so many ways and you in effect see how you are so impressed 
that you uh, you have in something where you uh, choose to be impressed and engaged. You let yourself be engaged. Mm. So it's such a wide spectrum of responses one that one could have. Yes, like, oh my God, who is this person? I think that that's typical of both self psychology and of focusing. That imp the importance of the receptivity of of the therapist. Uh, I like uh, Donald Stern's phrase, "courting surprise." That mm -hmm. that in both of these traditions, we learn how to court surprise. Uh, yeah. I love that she comes up by herself with the idea that I should ask. <laughs> Although that's such an implicit idea behind self-psychology. You don't have to put that out there. Yes, Mich Michelle notices that she found this herself. This wasn't in any way led by me, although it would be something that we would, that we would uh, think about in self-psychology. Yeah, Susan. <laughs> that was a focusing moment. Yes, that this came out of this this focusing moment of slowing down and pausing and seeing what would come right from the uh, the implicit in her. And that's where your voice changed. And that's where my voice changed. Yes, yes. How am I going to be responsible? How, how am I going to be responsible? How can I just do it and I get no response? And that's one of those moments when we can get anxious. Mm. Just because she's pulling for a response. So there, that's a one, I, in some ways that's a, and maybe this happens in self-psychology too, but I know it more from the focusing, is that moment of anxiety, if you can catch yourself feeling anxious, you can think, oh, this is a good moment to go inside. Uh huh. It keeps you off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> it, keeps you, it keeps you from uh, giving a response that's called for, which would be more cognitive. Uh huh. So, so Jude is saying that um, that it gets me off the hook, and instead of answering the question literally, and this was sort of a rhetorical question, really, but, but I could have gotten caught up and well, let's see how you can be responsible. Um, you've sent out all these resumes, and, uh, and uh, maybe who have you sent them to, or something like that. So it saves me from that kind of intervention that I f might feel pressured to, to, um, to, to go to that level. What saves me from going to that? The uh, Jude is saying that by turning the rhetorical question into uh, a real question that she could ask inside. I, I promise not to say ask inside. No, I said go inside. I could say ask inside. Uh, <laughs> that 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 saves me from having to um, respond to the question in its literal form. Yeah? I think it also, uh, I think that's the turning point of the whole session. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it gives her somewhere to go, indeed, when she's stuck. It's like, I didn't know there could be uh, some sort of positive uh, way to do anything here. And in that case, I just mm. 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 Yes, that she's sort of in a dilemma here. She's sort of stuck here, and when she finds this uh, a way to go. this developmental um, this developmental possibility, there's uh, an opening. Mm. 
Yes, yes. So Susan, who's both uh, a psychoanalyst and a focusing person, says this is where these traditions come together, the empathic attunement and the sensitivity to this implicit process that one can actually use as a resource that one can tap into. Yeah, you don't have to just call out. Yes, yes. Now this is, this is very much, I think, the way that we think as self-psychologists. We think about um, what, is the, what is the backstory here? What has this person experienced as a child that would bring them to this particular place? And so we might say, oh, there was no room for her in her family to be needy or to be in touch with her needs or to, or to ask, yes. And of course, I bet, how many of you self-psychologists were thinking that? And we have quite a few hands, yes. Yes. How how did we how did we co-create that together? The the positive, Ellen. Well, I think that it, uh, most of what you did was uh, tracking, which is mm -hmm. empathic interpretation, uh, forward edge uh, interpretation. It was it was interpreted in a in a self psychological way. And that sets the stage. I mean, that creates a receptivity, a trust, that makes that moment when your voice changes and you send her into this focusy place, uh, it makes it... <laughs> 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 they, they caught that. <laughs> that uh, <laughs> yes. Into the focusing cave, <laughs> but you know, I think that uh, I think that that's true, but I think that uh, it was uh, um, not as much the tracking before that moment that made the asking feel um, empowering, but what happened after when when she got in touch with the asking. Um, yeah, Jeffrey. One thing that struck me very strongly was that the patients who probably were either might know or might not know about these terms and these philosophies, theories, any of that, would not know that this was a blending of this and that or anything like that. <laughs> no. It would appear to be just a very seamless experience. And I think that that speaks to the, to the value of these two going together because it really is a whole. It, her experience would have been just a very solid um, sort of coming from one place, not, not, not blending or, or trying to stretch for anything. Absolutely. Uh, Jeffrey is involved um, with me in a, in a project of starting uh, an exploration of integrative approaches and how we integrate things. And uh, most of us, if not all of us, integrate more than one approach. And they, they are integrated um, inside us. We are an integration. That's our nature. And so, yes, it's, it's, they're living together uh, there. Um, I wanted to go back, though, to, to this idea of the forward edge interpretation. The, the place where I noticed that the most was when she stuck. To me, it seemed like there were two moments. There was the focusing moment, if we could call it that. And, uh, and then there was the, the moment where she's stuck. And I pick up the inactive um, quality of this. In self-psychology, where, where, and in focusing, actually, uh, but, but often more explicitly talked about 
in cell psychology, we're always thinking about uh, what is being enacted as well as what's being talked about. Uh, in focusing, actually, we would say, we would talk about that as the, the doing in the saying, that we're always doing something together. We are an interaction that is doing something. And what is that? It might be something very different than what we're talking about. Um, Jean Genlin actually uses this example that I love of, of, the, uh, of the client saying, nobody understands me, nobody listens to me. And if the therapist says, uh, but don't I understand you? Aren't I listening to you? Then it's the doing is the same thing that the client talks about. It's confirming that. If the therapist can say, oh, even here you don't feel understood, you don't feel listened to, then the doing is something different from the expectation of the, of the client. But, but in this instance, there was a doing that was uh, implicitly her asking, and she's, she's saying that, um, that she's not a person who, who asks. And uh, in, my, in my bringing that to her attention, uh, that's a kind of forward edge interpretation, I think. I'm saying, well, well you know, how, how is that? And then, of course, I'm offering it to her to see she might answer anything. She might say it's terrible. But, uh, but bringing that to her attention in a way that uh, values it, I think, enabled her to, to feel that uh, she and I can do this new way together and that uh, it could be empowering. Any other comments? I was wondering about uh, the shame she may have Yes, yes. It's very interesting because um, in her life she felt the shame, but she didn't feel that in, in the session. It, it felt like a whole new part of her. I guess it was really so outside the ordinary for both of us. Uh, here we're these two strangers having an encounter. It's like going to the bar and getting drunk and talking to the, well, not, not exactly like that. <laughs> I yes. Think, I think with your interpretation that she was a push through person, mm -hmm. um, in asking, you actually made a cognitive intervention. You were clearing up some cognitive dissonance for her. So it wasn't, I mean, she had already set the stage for that by saying she felt strong in doing it. Yes. But you confirmed that and made it less mm -hmm. me and not me. Yes. And this was her, and so it was okay, and she was still the same type of person. Right? Yes. And Yes, yes, yes. That that's very that's very interesting. There, um, something about the shame. Sure. I think you did acknowledge it earlier in some way. You know, because earlier you said, "I feel." She says, "I feel as if it's weak to ask. I'm grateful." So she gets into it there a bit. It's not appreciating all I have, all I think. Asking doesn't fit in with the feel you are in the world. There is a way in which you are resonating with her. Yes. And with her feeling of, of, of being shameful of that. And I think that, that helps you be more open to it. Absolutely. So both self-psychologically and in a focusing way, the resonating the, um, and the validating um, of, of the experience is, is through throughout here. I just want to say one other thing, and then we're going to move on, about the name. Um, the, the, the naming of her experience, the push-through person, was a very important part of the process. And in focusing, we, we learned that um, a word or a phrase can be a handle for, the, for a whole implicit living that's more complex than could be put into words. And this handle this phrase, a push-through person, is uh, the whole session hinges on that, really, and her being able to find that name. Um, so I'm going to, there's so much more we could say here, but uh, there will be time for questions. I want to now 
um, introduce you. This was so hard for me, this preparing for this talk, because I, I'm introducing the focusing people to self psychology, and there's you know a gigantic world there, and introducing the self psychologist to focusing, and then if I included the philosophy of the implicit, you'd have to spend about five years at least, maybe five years on least five years on each one, and I have about 10 minutes. Uh, but uh, I'm going to read a few lines from T.S. Eliot that um, will introduce this experiential world of focusing. At the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall, and the children in the apple tree, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard in the stillness between two waves of the sea. Does that give you a flavor for this territory, this territory of the space between conscious and unconscious, the meeting place? of conscious and unconscious, explicit and implicit. This is this joining, this edge of awareness that, that Jenlin talks about, it comes to us in a visceral way, not in a thinking way. We actually live from our implicit understanding or implicit grasp of things. We don't even know the next words that we're going to say. And if you're giving a talk, that can be pretty frightening, <laughs> right? The words have to come. And we can't control that. We can prepare, but who knows whether they'll come or they won't come. And that's a body coming. It's an organismic living. They come in the way tears come or laughter comes. Um, the, the words come from this larger understanding. And um, a, a, a simple way of thinking about what focusing is, is that it's sensing into this you as participants that the comments have been wonderful and the dialogue is very rich um, and uh, are you sure there isn't any last comment that anyone wants to say before we move on yes, yes come I don't really want to come up there either <laughs> <laughs> see I'll come up here and I'll have done what I wanted to say <laughs> ah, and you'll have to focus on it <laughs> Well, I just want to say, I, I really thank you all. It was wonderful. Each one of you was more wonderful <laughs> um, as you went on. But I think that focusing has been so important to me in a way that it has allowed me in myself and in my work to really get in touch with the more. And I think that a lot of us get stuck in anxiety and um, a sense of where to go with the patient. Um, and there's something of allowing something more to come that is very powerful um, and really has just shifted how I work. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to stop for a moment because I'm very anxious being up here. So I was going to say, when I, I worked at this hospital and after 9-11 um, we got this grant to um, provide training for the staff. And I invited Lynn to come. And uh, we were sitting around waiting for people to show up. And um, I think there were four of us. And Lynn said, well, let's just focus for a moment. And these people had not focused. And uh, she said, well, you know, there's a, there was a piece of chalk on the table. And um, she said, you know, how do you feel about that piece of chalk? Just, just kind of go inside your body right now and just see what comes there about this piece of chalk. I thought, oh my God, you know, a piece of chalk. <laughs> and um, so I look at this piece of chalk on the table, and I kind of close my eyes, and I think, um, well, it's a piece of chalk on the table. 
So then, you know, we all open up our eyes and, and Lynn asks us to share and this one guy says, well, I was thinking about this piece of chalk and how it really shouldn't be there, you know? And it should be back on the blackboard that is, you know, not too far away. And it's really annoying me, actually, that the piece of chalk is here. <laughs> and um, I immediately realized I didn't want him to take this piece of chalk and put it back on the board. I wanted a piece of chalk just where it was. <laughs> and um, I think what came out of that was this whole interaction then with him, kind of about, you know, attachment, you know, and what it means to lose something, as simple as a piece of chalk. <laughs> Um, and something just of how much is inside of us that we don't realize at any one particular moment um, that's around us, that we're reacting to, that we're interacting with, um, and that has so much information in it uh, about who we are all the time. Um, so it's influenced me tremendously, and uh, I thank Lynn very much for putting this all together. And uh, it's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you.